Hello, everybody. My name is Mark Chupka. I'm the Vice President for Research and Programs here at the Energy Storage Association. Thank you for attending today's webinar titled Staying Power, the Role of Energy Storage in Grid Resilience. This webinar is being recorded. Everyone who registered will also receive a link to the recording and slides within the next couple of days. Questions can be submitted at any time via the questions chat box in your browser, and we'll get to those after our speakers finish their presentations. In the text of your question, please indicate to whom you would like your question addressed. All meetings and teleconferences of the Energy Storage Association are held in accordance with our antitrust guidelines. We ask that you abide by these guidelines during today's webinar. The full guidelines are available in the members area of the ESA website. If you are not yet an ESA member and would like more information, you can reach out to my colleague, Brenda Lovell. Membership includes free access to all of our webinars, including many of those who are exclusively for members among numerous other benefits. Please contact Brenda for more information. Before we would begin, I would like to tell you about some upcoming events. The first upcoming event is coming up right after this webinar. We'll keep the conversation going about energy storage and resilience with Dustin Raggi of Black & Veatch. All registrants received an invitation and we'll also put that invitation in the webinar chat to copy and paste into your browser. It is already there in the chat uh, so it should be available to all of you. There's no charge to join, but we won't be recording the conversation. Registration is now open for the ESA annual conference, which will be held in Phoenix on December 1st through 3rd. Please visit our website for more details and it'll be great to see everyone again, or some of you for the first time. Finally, the week after the ESA annual conference is the American Clean Power Association Clean Power 2021 conference, to be held in Salt Lake City December 7th through 8th. This is also, this week is also Clean Power Week at ACP, and today, coincidentally, is Energy Storage Day. Today, we are exploring a fascinating and rapidly growing market for energy storage, namely the provision of grid resilience, which has evolved from a sometimes abstract and elusive concept to actual projects on the ground designed to reduce the incidents, length and severity of large-scale blackout events. I am delighted to introduce a great panel for today's discussion. First up will be Jonathan Monken from Converge Strategies, who will describe the value of resilience and how energy storage provides different pathways to enhance grid resilience. Next in line is Ted Coe, who will share some of his cutting-edge thinking about the role of distributed energy resources, including storage, in providing resilience and he offers some proposals on policy design and implementation. Our own Julian Boggs will be next. He is the state policy director here at ESA. Julian will describe what's going on at the state level and which states are leading the way in developing programs and policies that use storage to provide resilience. Our final presenter is Hannah Porter, who designs programs that incorporate storage into resilience investments at Portland General Electric in Oregon. Anna will tell us how PGE is responding to the resilience challenge using energy storage solutions. After their remarks, we'll open up the audience Q&A. You can ask questions via the chat box at any time, and we'll read those out for the presenters when we get to the Q&A session at the end. Now I'll turn it over to John. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very pleased to be participating in this panel with uh, really just a terrific topic. And of course, I trust that everyone has been celebrating Energy Storage Day appropriately. Uh, I would expect that everyone will be hosting large parties today, uh, not just for doing this particular webinar, but just for, for celebrating such a momentous day. So I'm excited to be part of it. And I really just wanna kick things off by taking this really from a high level view of a, a grid operator or an independent system operator. So I had uh, four years of experience working as the head of system resilience of PGM interconnection. Certainly storage was a very, very hot topic and continues to be so in discussions across the country, really just trying to figure out exactly how storage can be better integrated into systems, especially for the purpose of achieving better resilience outcomes. And so the title that I chose here was this idea of battle of the bulge, which is we're approaching a time where storage is going to be rapidly increasing its presence 
uh, to significant magnitude along all of these grid systems throughout North America and internationally. And so we just need to, I, I wanna talk through trying to understand and wrap our arms around how we can capture this resilience value as we deploy these storage assets on the system, both from a technical standpoint, but then also from a, a, an eventual benefit standpoint to the end use customers that are, are really going to see the impacts of having this increased storage on the system and what it's operationally capable of doing. So let's spend a few minutes, let's talk about grid scale batteries for resilience. And then I know we'll have an opportunity to hear from the rest of the panel before we have some questions and some discussion to follow things up. So first and foremost, this is one of the biggest challenges that I think we run into on a regular basis is just understanding what is the value of resilience. So it obviously does not have codified standards. It's not something that's quite so simple when it comes to things like rate recovery of investments and assets. And it's not something that's easily captured in the existing market constructs that we have. We certainly have some approximate measures for some of these types of things. You can certainly look at the unique performance capabilities or financial compensation and wholesale energy markets for assets that perform things like black start or certainly if we consider things like capacity performance market and the availability of those types of assets but storage is just a little bit of a different story and that's what i wanted to talk about here so what you see what you see on the right side here is an output from a tool called reopt which is something developed at nrel and this is something that we used uh, to actually conduct a value of resilience assessment as part of a project looking at paired pv plus storage specifically for the purpose of achieving defined community resilience outcomes. And so essentially what we look at is the traditional model of backup power when we're trying to provide energy resilience to specific facilities. One is done on usually on an individual building basis. And the second thing is nine times out of 10 or probably 99 times out of 100, what we see is just a diesel generator. You slap a diesel generator on it, you make sure that uh, every once in a while you test it, and then you set up a fuel service contract and hope for the best when something terrible happens. But essentially, there's a couple of reasons why that's done. One is that it's a proven technology. that You really understand what you're getting when you get a diesel generator. There's certainly a track record of performance, although I wouldn't necessarily highlight that consistently as a strength, because I think there have been many instances and many recent events where issues like maintenance of those generators, improper load match, or fuel availability have all resulted in um, malfunctions or challenges with those generators that prevented them from delivering energy to the facility it was designed to. The other issue is cost. So it's easy to write a justification letter for a diesel generator because it's become so widely accepted that it's really just kind of a rubber stamp process of saying, well, we need a generator. We know how much these things cost. There's lots and lots of data around operating costs and resource adequacy for that particular facility. And so it just kind of passes through the process. But what you'll see there in the readout for REOP Lite is really an understanding of a more dynamic approach to return on investment and what that really means. And so essentially what you have is looking at something like a base case and the all-in cost of a diesel generator, and then looking at the circumstances in which based on different configurations, you can achieve greater outcomes in terms of both the length, the operating capability from a, a duration perspective, how long can this resource continue to support specific aspects of what my facility needs to, to do, uh, or you can really offset a lot of potential costs when you look at fuel resupply the longer an event goes, because that really is a variable cost of traditional systems. And so essentially what you see here is an ability to try and optimize based on how much an individual customer is willing to spend on a backup generation source and how storage can play a vital role here that really kind of debunks the myth that, well, it's just outright, it's a more expensive resource and you can't do it. So essentially what you see here, are this concept of direct benefits or avoided costs. So when we talk about continuity of power for a longer period of time, than what an existing fuel service contract or even the operating limits of a, of a, a legacy generator or diesel generator are capable of doing, you can use kind of this belt and suspenders approach to try and extend fuel reserves, to try and have very quantifiable impacts to the community that's saying, well, if you can endure a, a, an outage of a length that exceeds kind of traditional planning models of three to five days and push that to the right, as you see on the chart, to nine days or longer, 
suddenly you're reaching this cost parity level that is not necessarily part of the existing dialogue right now and really should be of just understanding where the benefits are. So understanding this in context, I think, is, is important to have the conversation at scale of understanding when we look at the bulk electric system and we look at independent system operators or reliability coordinators, they have to take this type of an example and really extrapolate, right? Expand it out to a much larger system and understand how a lot of assets like this can provide performance characteristics that just can't be found anywhere else. So really, I think it comes down to trying to understand from a system level, there's really, there are multiple pathways to be able to get from where we are to where we want to be, which is understanding how storage solutions can be integrated in a meaningful way that provides these system level resilience benefits. And so here are a couple that I chose to highlight that I think are just helpful for the con both context and conversation here about what the technical capabilities of storage assets are. The first one is this idea of a nodes model, which basically says you look at these, uh, the potential for large grid scale storage assets that are strategically located along critical transmission intersections of the bulk electric system. There are many of these points throughout the North American grid in each of the interconnections that represent these kind of critical cogs in the much larger transmission system that the presence of a storage resource could do great things to offset some of the disruptions to traditional generation sources or even supplement things like interregional transfers of power that are commonly utilized, especially when there are disruptions to systems. Another category here is Black Start, which is really a traditional time tested model that exists right now and exists in kind of that beyond reliability frontier that I alluded to earlier, where it does provide elements of resilience to the bulk electric system that extend beyond just the traditional criteria of, of efficiency, efficiency and reliability. And so there are multiple ways in which storage can support black start functions that I'll highlight on the next slide. The next one is around aggregated resources. And this is really just looking at the potential for many, many small distributed energy resource storage assets to essentially behave as a large capacity resource. So there's a lot of information out there right now. There's certainly some changes in policy with things like FERC Order 2222, talking about the potential for these aggregated resources and their pathway to entrance into independent system operators or into wholesale energy markets. But this is another area where storage has a unique functionality and a unique dependability when you're looking at it at scale, saying a lot of small batteries acting in concert can have significant positive effects from a resilience perspective on the real-time operation of the system. And the last category here is around enhanced demand response, recognizing that when you have these large use customers or critical customers that you can take off the system in order to take pressure off the bulk electric system, well, certainly demand response is something that's present in any one of the reliability coordinator footprints today. But what I will say is very few of them are really supported by large scale storage. In many instances, it's, it's really a backup power solution that's on site, typically in the form of a diesel generator that doesn't necessarily have the same flexibility of dispatch or variable output capability that could meet the, the specific requirements of demand response in the context that I'm referring to here. So when we take one of these examples and look at it in greater detail, this was a, a technical analysis and report that I participated in as part of what was called the Solar Energy Innovation Network with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And, and what we were postulating here, and this was with my PJM hat on, is understanding what are the potential configurations of paired resources that could provide black start capabilities to the PJM system as an example. And essentially what you see here is two categories of asset configurations. One that I would categorize as kickstarts, which is currently present in all black start generators have to have a second onsite generator that provides the initial startup power for that larger generating asset. Now, in many instances, what you have is, is again, a diesel gen set that's on site to be able to provide that initial kick to a coal plant or a, um, a natural gas facility or something else that is tagged as a black start resource based on its unique performance capabilities. But here, what you have is an opportunity for either an on site storage asset or an offsite storage asset to be able to provide that local kick that's needed in order to get a larger generator online. There is some operational precedent here. There are a few assets out there on the system today that utilize storage in this particular way. But I think from a scalability standpoint, there's a lot more that can be done to be able to leverage storage 
for something that's already kind of codified in policy strategy and planning and market compensation mechanisms like Blackstart. The second category is more of the true Blackstart model of saying there is a dedicated capacity resource that meets very explicit performance requirements and capabilities that can be used to really jumpstart these specific transmission corridors or cranking paths to meet the requirements of critical loads on the system. And essentially, certainly, storage has all of the performance capabilities necessary to do it. One of the biggest challenges that we've had up until this point is some of the market-specific requirements around the duration of operation. So certainly, when you have a, a, a rapidly dispatchable asset, like a, a, a large-scale storage resource, it's great. You can access it right away. It certainly meets the ramp time requirements. It meets the, the flexible output requirements. But it really sometimes can be challenged because of the size of battery necessary to meet a duration requirement, for example, in PJM's territory, being 16 hours of runtime. Well, that's a really, really long runtime for a storage asset operating independently. So the understanding here is, is trying to figure out the technical solutions that allow batteries to participate or co-participate with resources like solar or wind or, or any other resource, but really putting the battery front and center and maximizing the performance capabilities that it does come and bring to the table uh, with meeting those types of requirements from, from the reliability coordinator perspective. So just a couple of ways that, uh, that we could potentially get there and just trying to highlight really the breadth of opportunity that exists right now within storage to meet multiple aspects of what grid operators would ultimately define as resilience. So what I'd like to do now is pass it off to the next panelist, which is Ted Coe. Great, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Ted Coe. I'm a independent policy and strategy consultant. I've um, been working in the energy storage policy space for uh, quite a few years. Uh, I, I want to do talk about uh, for today. I'm talking about resilient the role of storage in resilience as being defined by the regulatory frameworks that uh, individual states mostly will be creating to. Um, get towards a resilient grid as as their as their ultimate objective and so talking about this starting with starting at the highest level is to understand first that resilience is defined uh in layers on the system and each of those layers um are uh can be enabled and can and resilience can be enabled for each of those layers by energy storage and the advent of cost-effective energy storage at all these different levels and layers of the grid um, gives rise to the, the potential for um, markets and for uh, markets for resilient services to be created by policy to enable um, the resilient the deployment of resilient solutions uh, throughout the grid. And so, talking about this. Um, for the last couple of years, and with a lot of the incidents that have been happening, wildfires and floods and other kinds of things, that and hurricanes that have really um, brought the issue of resilience, electrical grid resilience, to the forefront in many people's minds. What ended up happening, what, what's happened is that for the most part, the discussion has been very high level. It's been like we would like more a more resilient grid, but there, but that hasn't been translated into a set of policies. Or sort of um, even terminology or agreed upon terminology that we can use to talk about what we mean when we say we want a resilient grid. So the um, I developed al along with um, a couple uh, collaborators this idea around how do we how do we define a resilience framework, a set of definitions and terminology um, that um, we can use collectively to all be on the same page and talk about talk about resilience in the same way. And, and then with that, having established a framework that we can agree on in terminology, then individual states can then develop their own resilience policy roadmaps on to you know what, where they want to actually be or what's the what's the end goal of a resilient grid, and then describe what policies they need to put in place to get there. And so that's all kind of a precursor to this idea of what's the role of storage going to be in that in that eventual resilient grid future. Is is understanding and and agreeing on the kind of definitions and frameworks around how we talk about the policies for resilience. So on the next slide, we start talking about just in general that again 
energy customers have been demanding resilience, you know, policymakers and talking about it with all these incidents, but people don't agree on or haven't really specified what, what they mean. Like, how long do you need backup power? Who pays for it? What's the role of a distribution utility versus a you know, uh, competitive marketplace? Um, does it need to be clean? Does, it, like, your, does your backup power need to be clean um, versus the kind of existing um, solutions for resilience that you have today? So what, what that's meant has been that even though we've had these incidents and this recognized need for a resilient grid for many years now, a lot of the policies around this that have been created are really just either pilots or demos or just really at the beginning stages of understanding what they need to be. And they've been pretty inconsistent around the country. So what we've had um, in the, up, up till now has been a lot of reactive studies about you know, what happened during these incidents and then pilot programs of what we could do um, and, some, and some initial incentive programs for um, doing some resilience deployment. But the, no agency or no state um, that I've seen in the country has set out a real plan, a framework and a plan for this is, you know, this is where we want to go. This is, this is the end state or the vision for a resilient grid. And this is how we're going to get there. So um, I'm going to talk in the next few slides about uh, a proposal, an idea around how to create these frameworks and then how to design your roadmaps. So uh, starting, with, starting with the whole exercise, this whole idea, this whole concept starts with what is your long-term objective? I'm not going to go through this like every bullet on the slide, but an example of what you could set as your ultimate vision is that you have a, a system uh, which which is a combination of like a competitive marketplace as well as a you know government backed programs that provides every electricity consumer with the resilient microgrid that they need um, to you know commensurate with their risk of outages and the, and the impact and the and the cost and the impact of these outages um, to to the population to the consumer. And if you think about this as the like the ultimate destination, the, the large the the vision for where you want to go, it looks like a essentially a self-sustaining marketplace. Is in, in our approach or my opinion on this is that you look at a self like a self-sustaining marketplace where people can define what resilient service they want and what we call resilient service levels, and then you can transact in that, and you can transact in what the um, um, getting the solution with either with your utility, with a third party competitive provider, um, with your community, um, like you as the consumer, as the person who needs the resilience um, or the business that needs the resilience can um, do a transaction to you know, pay for that solution that you, uh, that you need. And so ultimately you want that to be a marketplace where those transactions can happen you don't need government support or subsidies for that uh, in you know, 90 plus percent of the cases. And then in the places where there's market failures, where there's places where you know, populations need resilience but um, can't necessarily afford to pay for it, um, you have the government um, supported programs that are ongoing to support those solutions for those uh, populations. So in order to get to this destination, the idea is, the idea is to like, put it in context, like, every program would def kind of define the roadmap of policies that will get you here. And so you need to define like who your consumers are, what your different types of consumers are, what you mean by a microgrid, what you mean by a resilient backup solution, what you mean by clean energy if you want it to be clean, and then what you mean by design, like d matching the solutions to the people's needs. And that's what we call the resilient service level structure. And so I'll, I think my last slide on this will just be to describe this idea of resilient service levels. This idea is like anytime you have a marketplace for anything, any product or service, you need to be able to define that product or service and what you want. And so you can understand how to value it and how to pay for it. And so uh, referencing a little bit of what Jonathan talked about is like, how do you value it resilience is to go with each scenario of the people that are looking for the resilience or need the resilience and define with them what what they mean. Like, what do you mean by resilience? Which which lows do you want backed up? How fast do you want needed to be backed up? And then how long do you need it to be backed up? 
are three of the kind of key attributes of how you define a service level of resilience that you might want um, to pay for. And so, or that you, 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 the consumer might want to pay for, or in a kind of government sponsored utility built uh, like community microgrid or resilient solution, you know, what the regulator would um, be willing to pay for and how much they're willing to pay for or approve the, the you know, investment in um, for a resilient solution needs to be described in a, in a specific enough way that the solution providers can then uh, provide the solution and to the specs of what, what you're asking for. So this, this slide just has some examples of the ideas of resilient service levels and how you could specify resilient service levels. And so with these concepts, and I think that might be my last slide. Oh no, one more. Okay, with these, with these concepts, taking the idea of like who are your who are your customers or who are your um, you know who who needs the resilience, and then how do you specify how much they need, and then how do you describe the policies that will set up the marketplaces for solution providers to provide those solutions to those needs? Is you could put it on a this is what we we encourage for uh, the regulators, the policymakers in any in any state or jurisdiction, is to set up that roadmap to set out the idea of here is a set of timelines of development of this ultimate marketplace where you want to eventually get to a self-sustaining marketplace for these services. And then here, the, uh, the rows of this particular table are all, um, the, again, the different categories of customers and people who, who need, need the resilience. And then the boxes in this table are examples of like what stage of the market development you're at and what policies you have in place at that stage of market development. So this is, again, just an example of, of an idea of the kind of roadmap that you could create from a policy point of view for your, um, for your, uh, for your state. And then the idea being that if you want to, you know, as you're creating policies and incentive programs or even pilots and things like that um, to get um, resilience, uh, those resilience market developed, you could put it against this timeline to understand in this context around you know how how well you're doing and how well you're defining um, your programs and your and your your incentives for to develop this marketplace. And so that's um, that's I think my last slide, and I will then pass it on to Julian. Thanks. Ted, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Julian Boggs. I'm the State Policy Director at the Energy Storage Association. Uh, and I, so I am going to be talking, just diving into a little bit more specifics about uh, what some states are doing around resilience policy. And um, additionally, I, you know, before I get into that context, want to talk a little bit about some of the work that we did over. Uh, the summer at the Energy Storage Association with a uh, working group um, developing uh, ESA's resilience policy. Um, sorry, I got ahead of myself um, with the slides there. So uh, as, as Ted mentioned, I think at one point, there really isn't a state um, that has a, a fully fleshed out comprehensive resilience program or you know and 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 really uh it's not something we see at the wholesale markets or the, or the bulk power sector level either and and so um you know we, we started to want to take an initial crack at this um through a through a working group of esa members um over the course of the summer and uh hoping to release this policy statement in the coming months but wanted to give folks a preview of it now so some of the challenges that we were looking for, and um, Jonathan spoke to this as well, I think initially, is that you know resilience is is often uh, undefined uh, in in policy, uh, and that so when you don't have a value of resilience, it, you know it's difficult to invest and, and justify in, in investment, um, public or private, when there's um, no specific uh, service, um, uh, monetary service that that you're um, investing in. Uh, and so first thinking about how to, um, uh, okay, answering this question that everybody's trying to answer right, and <laughs> I think both of the previous speakers talked about, what's the value of resilience? 
uh, one of the things that we came to is that, uh, you know, it's hard to set a value if you haven't defined what you want. And I think Ted just said this. And so um, we really recommend that each jurisdiction, and I think a lot of what I'll talk about, and obviously as the state policy director, my focus has been on the states, but this could also be done uh, at a you know R RTO ISO level, or I, I suppose so potentially uh, with uh, the federal government through regu federal regulators, but um, or a, or a very local jurisdiction. But the jurisdiction needs to conduct the baseline assessment to determine, you know, what are the uh, uh, you know what's the current status of of resilience? What are the uh, potential resilience threats? Uh, looking at you know future data as well as historical data, um, and then identify some preliminary targets for, for varying types of load, um, knowing that uh, you know, certain critical uh, infrastructure is gonna be more important, certain, certain communities, certain um, areas of the grid, um, this is particularly true on the distribution level, um, you, know, you might wanna prioritize a higher resilience service level over others, and then, and then start to look at mitigation options, including, of course, the, the, um, uh, the value of energy storage. Um, and, and once you've done that, then you can use that to conduct cost-benefit analysis that's certainly gonna be important for any public investment, particularly um, if that ultimately is provided by ratepayers, um, and, and, and then, and then uh, solidify those, those uh, targets. Um, and then, so once you have, you, so, so that first section is really defining what you want uh, out, out of resilience, you being the jurisdiction. And then the second uh, uh, step I would say uh, uh, describe this as is you know thinking about your compensation and so could come in uh, you know a variety of mechanisms um, and 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 we focused on uh, you know public comp uh, uh, compensation thinking about how we're um, doing public purpose microgrids and, and investing public dollars to, um, uh, to to meet those goals and so uh, you know, that could come from utility investments, in which case you would need to have commission proceedings, with clear guidelines to utilities about uh, what sorts of investments would be, uh, in order to meet these res uh, resilience targets, what sort of uh, investments would be considered prudent. At the, at the wholesale market level, certainly it can get a little bit more complex. And, and you know, Jonathan can, I think, you know, speak to uh, 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 with more specificity about resilience at the, at the bulk power level. Um, but I think our group certainly agreed that there is the potential for uh, wholesale market products um, that are uh, resilience specific products at the wholesale market level. Uh, and then we have seen over, particularly over the course of the last year, a lot of federal investment um, that ultimately can be directed to uh, resilience. Um, and, and we think it's important that any of that state and federal investment be invested. I, you know, I think we see a lot of, for example, microgrid pilots or uh, discrete investments that don't necessarily, they can, but they don't always add up to a comprehensive programs that is achieving a, a desired level of resilience um, over a, a, a desired jurisdiction. Um, so that just hopefully gives folks a little flavor um, about how we've been thinking about resilience at the Energy Storage Association um, through the working group. Uh, the next thing I wanted to do is just take folks on a quick tour of how states uh, are approaching this. So we're gonna um, go into Connecticut, Vermont, California, Oregon. Uh, there are other states certainly that have uh, various uh, resilience policies, but I thought each of what one of these examples um, uh, provided a you know specific new lens into how states, I would say, mostly on a piecemeal level, are approaching uh, resilience themselves already. So in Connecticut, where I have been um, spending a lot of my time recently, the uh, Public Utility Regulatory Commi uh, Authority recently uh, approved a program that is set to launch in January. Um, to achieve 580 megawatts of behind the meter storage by 2030. So a nine-year program, um, but for the size of Connecticut, pretty significant in terms of behind the meter storage. 
And uh, it applies to all customer classes, commercial, industrial, residential, um, but the program design um, does uh, put specific emphasis and specific priority into four categories. Um, and, and three of those, the, the fourth category is small business, but three of those categories are really kind of, you think of them as resilience customers and, and, and the authority really thought of them as resilience customers. And so, I, you know, I think that the interesting piece here is just thinking about how you're um, defining again, those kind of specific categories, knowing that resilience is gonna be prioritized for um, either certain customers, certain areas on the distribution grid, um, certain types of uh, types of load. And so the first one of these entities is, is, is customers on the grid edge. And, and I thought this, you know, kind of was probably the most interesting concept to point out. And so the authority is defining this as the 10% of circuits with the most outages, with the most frequent outages, uh, and the 10% of circuits with the longest outages. And so customers that are on those circuits qualify for this, 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 um, you know, an additional prioritization. Um, and uh, uh, the other um, the other types uh, of of these kind of re resilience customers that are being prioritized are um, the fossil fuel backup generation. So if you already have fossil fuel backup generation and investing in storage, plus presumably plus some level of solar, uh, is is going to allow you to uh, get rid of the fossil fuel backup generation uh, and rely on a cleaner solution. Um, you know that can uh, get this extra bonus, and then uh, critical facilities as as well. Um, at, you know, defined in a in a specific way that actually also includes uh, multifamily affordable housing. Um, I, one thing I will just say uh, when talking about this, I've been a little bit vague about what the incentive is. That's because we're, we're not thrilled about what it is, um, the way they designed this program there. The incentive is actually uh, allowing the customers to participate in the wholesale capacity markets. We think they should have just been allowed to participate on their own. It's a slightly other issue, but in case folks were wondering about <laughs> the, the, the design of the incentive is not ideal, but I think What's, what's, what's important here is thinking through about what sorts of customers and what sorts of loads um, you, you might want to uh, deliver further incentives to. Um, so going on to the next slide in Vermont, again, this is a little bit about just the kind of the identification, the um, assessment and the identification of priority uh, areas for resilience investment. And so Green Mountain Power, uh, which um, you know, has a, its most recent approved climate uh, plan that has been approved by the commission, they, they have one resiliency zone that they've already created and are proposing to create an, a number of additional resiliency zones um, so that in these geographic areas, they're able to support and sustain critical emergency response activities, knowing that it's not gonna be realistic to have that level of resiliency service everywhere. What are the, what are the, um, uh, what are the areas where it's important to? So looking at the, the, you know, working with state and local stakeholders, I think that's probably a criti critical point if you're talking about how to prioritize investment um, and looking at critical facilities, um, places where there are already reliability deficits Again, thinking to, back to Connecticut on those grid edge customers, similar theme there. Um, and then places where there's also communications deficits. Uh, and then uh, with, you know, so now that you have resiliency zones, um, the Green Mountain Power, the climate plan is gonna be, uh, you know, their, their mechanism is, is basically through the development and deployment of microgrids in those uh, that have islanding capabilities in those resiliency zones. So my next slide, I believe, is California, which is a little bit texty. Excuse that. Uh, there we go. Oh, sorry. So uh, excuse the textiness of California. Um, so there's been an ongoing microgrid proceeding. Um, I think Ted participated in that proceeding, so he might be a better person for questions to ask about California than me, but I, I did want to point it out. So um, the most recent iterations of this have been driven by legislation, Senate Bill uh, 1339, that broadly directed the, the commission to, to facilitate the commercialization of microgrids. 
Um, and uh, one of the specific uh, decisions that's coming out of that rulemaking is um, suspending capacity reservation component of the standby charge for eligible microgrids. And so that, you know, ultimately um, leads to uh, um, uh, an incentive for, for microgrids. Uh, and then another really uh, compelling piece that's coming out of California is the ongoing working groups that are developing a framework for resiliency and particularly a concept for a value of resiliency. And so this um, four, four pillars of, of resiliency valuation are, are, is something that I pulled from a um, CPU slide from that working group. Um, and, and, and so there, and, and this also, I should say, informed the development of ESA's uh, re resilience policy statement. So again, thinking through that baseline assessment, mitigation measure assessment, um, uh, we didn't quite have a resiliency scorecard, but thinking about, okay, what's the value? Um, uh, how are we evaluating these, these various mitigation measures? Um, and again, they have a sort of a, a self-assessment there at the end. Um, so that is California. <laughs> Since our next speaker uh, is representing an Oregon utility, I don't want to spend a ton of time in, on Oregon, but I do want to just flag uh, for everyone um, legislation that passed in 2021, Oregon's 100% clean energy standard, um, created the opportunity for, um, I, I think, some uh, potentially uh, inter very interesting action at the uh, Oregon Commission. Um, and, and this is just the, the legislation um, includes this uh, component that uh, utilities must submit clean energy plans and those clean, clean energy plans include a risk-based assessment for um, examination of resiliency opportunities that includes costs, consequences, outcomes, and benefits based on re reasonable and prudent industry resiliency standards and guidelines established by the Public Utility Commission. And so I do think there is the opportunity there, there for this framework define targets, to define guidelines for utilities so that utilities can then um, uh, propose investments. And I will turn it over to one of those utilities now. So um, thank you very much. And over to you, Hannah. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Um, I'm Hannah Porter. I'm an associate product developer out here at Portland General Electric in Oregon. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to move quickly through these first few slides, but you'll have access to them after the presentation to review. Um, so PGE at a glance, we are a vertically integrated company serving just under a million customers across 4,000 square miles. Um, there we go. Some of our, we have five large-scale storage projects. Some are proposed, some are active. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about each of these today, but rather we'll focus on the proposed personal battery pilot and the residential smart battery pilot, both of which are residential storage projects here at PGE. I'm going to start with our proposed personal battery pilot. I say proposed because we're, we're in the middle of our research phase for this and we haven't yet moved to the point of drafting a formal pilot for approval or development. Um, but essentially, for some customers that are critically reliant on electricity to power medical devices, being without power for just a few minutes can become a life or death situation. So the personal battery pilot would be designed to support our most vulnerable customers during an outage with a low to no cost personal battery to help bridge the gap until power is either restored help can arrive or the customer can get to a safe place. So our first step in this initiative was to establish who those customers are. Uh, we're keeping our customer target really narrow for this initial phase. So we're focusing only on those who live in a public safety power shutoff zone, who are critically reliant on electricity for medical purposes and are also income qualified. And when I say electricity for medical purposes, I'm talking about devices like cardiac devices, ventilators, CPAP machines, wheelchair, electric wheelchairs, mobility devices, etc. So over the last year, we've been conducting some in-depth interviews uh, with people who are reliant on electricity for medical purposes or our caregivers. And from these interviews, we've developed a quantitative survey that is actually 
set uh, to field in day now, which will further direct this pilot design. And from those initial discussions, we found that leaving home is frequently not an option for these customers during an outage event. So providing an at-home uh, resiliency solution could be a life-saving effort. We've also received feedback that any product that we develop needs to be easy to access, easy to use, it should be at low to no cost to be accessible to our low income customers and has to be matched appropriately with the power needs of the equipment. So what we're really wanting to achieve at this stage is a demonstration of a proof of concept with our smallest and most vulnerable group. So those customers that are occupying the center of this Venn diagram. So as we hopefully demonstrate a viable portable battery program, We'd like to remove each of these qualifiers and expand the program to include potentially people who are not in PSPS zones, um, but perhaps meet the other two criteria. We're also exploring the possibility of creating a personal battery pilot program to people who are medically vulnerable, but perhaps not income qualified, potentially with the option of a lease to own or to purchase a resiliency product from PGE at the customer's expense. Again, these are um, at the discussion and research stage, no formal pilot uh, has yet been developed. The primary decision drivers behind our personal battery proposal are customer needs, as I've already discussed. We've done market insights research, um, and we've seen a needs gap in our service territory, where we're going to focus on providing solutions to the most critically impacted customers with this initial offering. And here in Oregon, as was just mentioned, um, with our previous speaker, we've also had two recent pieces of legislation that are further directing this program design. House Bill 2475, um, under this bill, the utility is able to propose free or discounted offerings for low-income customers. And House Bill 2021, which authorizes the Public Utility Commission to consider differential energy burdens. So it essentially tells the utility that we need to focus on the needs of customers who are members of environmental justice communities when developing our products and programs. These communities can include seniors, people living with disabilities, low-income customers, et cetera. And of course, as we continue to experience climate change, which in the Northwest, this has recently meant week-long ice storms, massive heat domes over our region with temperatures topping 115 degrees, um, we're needing to plan for worsening weather. So as we continue to see these expanding public safety power shutoff zones, um, in fact, PGE actually only called its first ever PSPS in 2020. And unfortunately, we are expecting to call more in coming years. Um, along with longer and more frequent event days, customers, municipalities, and businesses are starting to think of resiliency as a necessity to weather the changing climate. A primary challenge that we're encountering in the development of this proposed pilot really is how we want to define the role of PGE and the utility within this space. The biggest question we're grappling with is why is it appropriate for the utility to provide these services and not those as emergency managers at the government or nonprofit level? Next, does the role of the utility change when the outage is caused by a public safety power shutoff versus during an unexpected outage? And finally, when creating these resiliency solutions for our most vulnerable customers, who is going to bear the cost burden and how are we going to fund this? Our second key challenge is shifting how we view resiliency. So up to this point, typically resiliency products are used in grid services, frequency response, peak shaving, contingency reserve, in which added resiliency for the customer is a positive side effect. But we want to start looking at um, new products and programs and start to view these, view resiliency as the primary driver and the primary goal for our customers rather than just a side effect. And as those of you in the utility and share are aware, shifting the internal thinking of your own company can often be the, the largest hurdle that you face. So, our next steps with our personal battery proposal are to finish out our quantitative survey research to round out our research phase, which will then allow us to build out a personal battery pilot in which we will establish a funding mechanism and hopefully be rolling out personal batteries to those living in PSPS zones before we have another major weather event. 
Moving from personal batteries out to uh, whole home backup options, we currently have the Smart Battery Pilot, which is running here in Portland. It's been operating since August of 2020. It's set to close after five years. We're treating this primarily as an R&D project with the main objective being to optimize the learnings of how behind the meter storage can and should be used. We have a target of creating a virtual power plant of about of 525 residential batteries that PGE can call upon for grid services during peak events. We've given customers the opportunity to receive monthly on-bill credits uh, for allowing PGE full access to their residential battery. The difference in the amount there is dependent on whether the customer's battery can only charge from rooftop solar or whether it can also be grid charged. Uh, last check, we had 53 enrolled customers, and we're working with our marketing team to drive enrollment to hit our goal of 525. We're seeing a limited uptake right now of that $3,000 upfront incentive rate, but we have a second incentive rate of $5,000 that's income qualified, and that's proving to be more popular. So we're optimistic that with some more outreach pushes and potentially we're discussing a possible restructuring of the pilot, to offer a higher incentive level, um, that will help us reach our target. So as we um, continue to work on this pilot, we're using it as a way to learn more about the attitudes around residential batteries. Some of the areas we're focusing on are whether or not customers will accept PGE control of a battery, what hurdles to battery adoption exist, who the target market most likely is to purchase battery storage, how willing a customer is to pay for outage avoidance, and identifying the gaps between battery performance and customer expectations, especially when it comes to the longer duration outages that Portland has experienced in the last year and a half. So this data um, on whole home battery systems combined with the research that we're doing on personal batteries are both going to help us build out new residential resiliency products to meet the wide variety of needs of our customers. Um, in our service territory in coming years. Thank you very much. All right, thanks so much, Hannah, and thanks uh, so much for the other panelists. Uh, many of you have already submitted questions, uh, and you can continue to ask questions during the Q&A session uh, by using the question chat box. Now, uh, we only have a few minutes for questions. Uh, I'll have to go through some of these, uh, but uh, we're hoping that uh, uh, most of you will be able to uh, continue the conversation uh, on the Zoom platform in a few minutes. Um, a question for Hannah. Um, the, the, what kind of uh, quantitative analysis have you been conducting uh, to show the value of these programs and what do you think the PUC is going to need to uh, to justify uh, or what will you need to justify these programs at the, at the PUC in terms of quantitative value? Um, yeah, so right now with the smart battery pilot, so the at-home, the um, residential batteries, those are all um, being measured through a DERMS platform. So we're able to measure every time we, we call an event and see what people's responses are, and then we, what the battery response is. And then we actually have a online community platform for the customers who are enrolled in the Smart Battery Pilot, where we can field a variety of questions, um, moderate conversations, and get real-time feedback to events, um, which, covers a really wide gamut of discussions, everything from just like, you know, what's working, what's not, all the way up to what changes in like the program in order to give us that data that we need. For the small personal battery program, um, we're doing a, a quantitative survey right now that's really discussing what kind of energy needs this particular subset of the population has in order to bridge the gap of a critical outage. Like how long is a critical outage to these customers? How much power do they need to bridge that? What are their backup options? Um, and, and then from there, the hope is to, to identify um, particular, particular battery makes and models in order to, to, 
to um, properly match with those customers. Did I cover everything in that? <laughs> yeah, no, thank you very much. That was, uh, mm -hmm. was that. Um, I've got a question here. Well, actually, it's a, more of a comment. Uh, I think going back to Jonathan's presentation, uh, the comment is uh, energy storage systems for Black Star during the February Texas power outage would have added six gigawatts of wind to the ERCOT grid. Um, Jonathan, you want to comment on the importance of Black Star uh, capability to um, to getting the grid up and running in a in a significant event scenario. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that that can be that can serve as the saving grace or the Achilles heel of the bulk electric system in an operating condition like they saw in ERCOT after Winter Storm Uri. I mean, essentially, I think the batting average for Black Star resources during that event was exceptionally low. And that in and of itself, I think, speaks volumes about what the relative susceptibility of a system like that to disruptions caused by weather events or anything else for that matter um, highlights the needs for a different approach instead of the traditional model of, of resource planning when it comes to identifying the types of capacity resources that are going to provide those services. And so I think it's well said there that, you know, if you can leverage existing generation sources in a much more efficient and effective way specific to Black Start, you can fundamentally change the outcome for the larger system. And I think looking at that particular event in context, there were not widespread impacts to transmission infrastructure as there were, for example, with Intergy when we look at the, uh, the hurricane event in Louisiana months later. So if you can improve capacity and resource availability in an event like Texas saw, you've got physical infrastructure in place, you just didn't have the resources needed in order to deliver on the system. And I think it's a great example of where storage can play an increased role in a way that directly benefits the resilience outcomes associated with Blackstar. So I think it's well said. Okay, perfect, John. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, I've afraid, I'm afraid we've uh, arrived at the end of the hour. and I'd like to thank the presenters for a very informative session. Please join me for a discussion with Dustin Raggi of, of Black & Veatch in a few minutes. Uh, hop on over to the Zoom platform and uh, we'll continue this discussion and uh, push it in new directions as well. Um, so, uh, and, and please do look into the ESA annual uh, convention uh, in December 1st through 3rd. Uh, please stay self safe and healthy and have a great rest of the day. I'll, hop, I'll see you over in the, I'll see you in December in Phoenix and I'll see you on the Zoom platform in a minute.